Uh, good evening. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Temple ISD Board of Trustees on November 9th, 2020, starting here at 6 p.m. Our first item is to declare a quorum, which we do have. Our second item is the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everybody please stand? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one in <clears throat> Item three is uh, public forum, and we do have one individual signed up. Right now, the citizens are offered opportunity to address the board. Uh, since subject matter may not be on the agenda, the board cannot engage in discussion or board action cannot be uh, taken. And uh, everybody's advised that you have three minutes uh, for your comments. Our uh, Rayford Brown has signed up. And Mr. Brown, would you please, if you come to the podium, you have three minutes. Mr. Posey, Superintendent Ott, what does socialism do? Since we're moving closer to it in this country, uh, many people are not aware that the definition of socialism or ca is capitalism, all the individuals own the capital. Under socialism, the government owns the capital. That's the end goal is communism. Socialism, according to Winston Churchill, is a philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance, the gospel of envy. It is inherent virtue is the equal sharing of misery. And Margaret Thatcher said, the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. <laughs> socialism continually seeks to decrease individual freedom and to increase state control. When true power is who gets and who waits. And that's the definition of when the government owns everything. Socialism has often led to insurrection and revolt as we see with Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, which Black Lives Matter? Does Ben Carson's life matter? Does uh, the black police chief that was guarding the store that was murdered, does his life matter? Anarchy always leads to, is very short-lived and leads to uh, a dictatorship. Somebody. They will, people will ask for somebody to come in and straighten things out. Socialism is always inefficient and a heartless way to meet needs. Economically, you are at least careful about quality or cost when you are spending someone else's money to meet strangers' needs. Uh, think about how that works. Socialism has continued to invade many aspects of American life. We see it, uh, a doctor in our little community back home, told me when we first got Medicare, he said, this is a slippery slope from which we can never climb out. When people can determine who waits and who gets with medicine, they control your life. Instead of investing in the future, socialism always ends up borrowing more and more. Federal borrowing to meet today's socialist needs is presumption on tomorrow's taxpayers and cruelty to tomorrow's poor. And my addition to that is to those who are not old enough to vote or are not even born yet. What right do we have to borrow from our children and from their children to meet our temporary needs caused by a simple virus that 99.96% of the people survive? And school-aged children are hardly ever impacted at all. And healthy people, only 10% of the people actually died of COVID. My time's up, I take it. Item four is superintendent's recognition. Sorry. Item four is superintendent's recognition. Our first one is the alumni spotlight presentation, Mrs. Catherine Beimer. You're the 
first batter up. <laughs> Born in 1919 in Temple, Texas, Ms. Katherine Robertson Beimer is the first woman to be recognized in the alumni spotlight at the young age of 101. She would probably tell you that it's about time. <laughs> of, uh, yes, of four, and I did not ask her age. Her, her family told me. I knew better than that. Uh, a force to be reckoned with for over 50 years, Catherine Beimer was a local retail leader promoting downtown Temple as a shopping destination and later helping to establish 31st Street as a vital artery in the city's business community. Catherine attended Reagan Elementary School and then graduated from Temple High School in 1936. After graduating from Temple High, Catherine attended Southwest Te Texas State Teachers College, now Texas State University, and taught for several years in a one-room schoolhouse right outside of Temple near Holland, which had 20 students ranging from kindergarten to 12th grade. At the onset of World War II, she married Frank Beimer and spent the subsequent years following him from naval base to naval base up and down the East Coast. After World War II, they returned to Temple and established Beimer's Jewelers in downtown Temple in 1947. For the first few years of the business, Catherine worked as a secretary at Scott & White to support the family. In 1951, she joined Beimer's Jewelry full-time and the store began to experience massive expansion. In 1971, the store was relocated to the blossoming 31st Street Retail District. From 1951 to 1992, when the store closed, Catherine oversaw all the finances, inventory, and staffing of the business, including the design and construction of their last store on 31st Street, where Precious Memories Florist now operates. In short, she was the genius behind the business that expanded Beimer's jewelry from a single watch bench in the corner of a drugstore to over 5,000 square feet of jewelry real, uh, retail establishment. In 1981, she stepped in to help raise three of her grandchildren after her daughter-in-law passed away from cancer, but Catherine remained firmly in charge of the business during this time. At the age of 73, she retired from the jewelry business, and at the age of 80, she retired from raising grandchildren. After retiring, she spent many years volunteering um, as a yellow bird at Scott and White uh, Hospital, Meals on Wheels through Grace Presbyterian Church. Please join me in recognizing Katherine Robertson Beimer, class of 1936, for our alumni spotlight. You'll be happy to know I'm completely speechless. No prepared <laughs> remarks at all, so I'll just speak from the heart. First of all, I want to recognize this incredible posse that you have here <laughs> that, that showed up in support of you. Her tribe. Uh, yeah, her tribe. <laughs> I will tell you, Catherine, I heard that you made remarks to the newspaper that you didn't feel like you've done enough to be recognized. And... And here's what, I, here's what I will say. It's not, about, it's not about what you've done. Sometimes it's about who you are. Mm -hmm. and, and I will tell you, everybody, without exception, speaks very highly of you and who you are as a person. So we are so blessed and honored mm -hmm. for you to be here today. And welcome, Catherine, class of 1936. That's just incredible. We're so <laughs> proud of you. So thank you very much for being here. Do you want to say anything? Oh, well, I'm so just thank you for having me. Thanks for having you. We are honored. We are honored. We are absolutely. absolutely honored to have you. And would you like to introduce uh, the folks that are here? Would you want to come up? Yes, yeah, one of you. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Come on up. Here. Mm -hmm. I'm Mike. I'm her son. I'm Mike. I'm her son. Uh, where are we at here? <laughs> Ryan is grandson. Grandson's wife back here. <laughs> uh, Great granddaughter in that lap, great grandson in the other lap over there, uh, and the with the other grandson. with the other two grandkids, mm -hmm. and then yeah, great yeah, that's right. Those are great grands. <laughs> Jama back here, who's a TISD employee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she started earlier, mm -hmm. and Marla here. So that's it. <laughs> thank you, and thank yes. you for what you've done. Oh, you bet. And I'll tell you, I sure hope that you are as proud as the school di of the school district as we are of you. <laughs> we are so proud of you. Thank you so much for being here. I am too. It's a great.
great district. I'm glad my kids can go here. We appreciate you. Thank you Thank so you. much. <laughs> and when when we did decided to honor Ms. Beimer when I, I spoke with Ryan. Um, I said, we can do this a lot of different ways. We can come to the house and we can video and then we can show it at the board meeting. We can FaceTime you during the board meeting. And Ryan's response was, no, she's coming. <laughs> I said, all right, well, then bring her on. So we are so excited that she was able to join us this evening. Our next item is the Friends of Temple ISD Ward, Mr. Drayton McLean Jr., McLean Group. If you come up here, Mr. McLean. The Friend of Temple ISD Wildcat Award allows the district to formally recognize high-level partners for their contributions. Drayton McLean Jr., chairman of the McLean Group, has been a longtime friend and supporter of Temple ISD. Mr. McLean, who has made his home in Temple for over 50 years, has publicly and quietly <clears throat> supported the work and projects of Temple ISD. Mr. McLean's two sons, Drayton McLean III and Denton McLean, are graduates of Temple High School. He has personal ties to the district and has always made it a priority to listen and consult with our district le leadership over the years. Publicly, he has been a strong supporter of the recent district bond campaigns. He took a very visible position with the PAC supporting the bonds and advocated for their passage. This helped ensure their overwhelming success. He has also quietly backed the district in other ways, not wanting publicly any attention for your positive actions. He gener his generosity has benefited several district facilities and our marketing efforts. Perhaps his greatest gift to the district is the advice and guidance he has shared with our district leadership. His questions and challenges have sharpened the district's focus and set up the district for greater success. For these reasons and so many more, please join me in recognizing Drayton McLean Jr. as a true friend of Temple ISD. Oh, I'll make a few comments because I am certain that Drayton will want to make some comments. Uh, first of all, our students made that uh, mm -hmm. from our CT mm -hmm. center, and I know that you would appreciate that. Uh, as Christine said, Drayton has done a lot for the school district over the years, and he's managed to do it in the shadows. So for us to pull him out of the shadows mm -hmm. to be recognized, that was certainly a tall order. I uh, appreciate everything you've done. I appreciate the inspiration that you have given, not just myself, but many people in the district. You have great ideas, constantly asking questions, which I love, uh, but you're challenging us. You're always challenging us to be better, uh, and you're proud of us. You advocate for Temple ISD as well. So we really appreciate you, and, and, and we're honored to make you a friend of TISD. Well, thank you, Chairman Posey, and to the entire school board and to the superintendent. This is terrific. You can be a graduate, and I didn't have to take a test. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's terrific to, to be a graduate. And as she said, mm -hmm. I have two sons that are mm -hmm. proud that they're Temple Wildcats. They graduated, and it sent them very well prepared for their future when they went to college and in, in their adult life, and they have taken a lot of responsibility. Ms. Beimer, uh, she took a lot of my money over the years <laughs> <laughs> that my wife Elizabeth's birthday is the 28th of January, so I would come see you in 1st of January, and she was my counselor and advisor. <laughs> the other thing is you graduated in 1936, that is a significant year. That's the year I was born. So, see, we sh we share the 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 joys of 1936. But to to Temple, to to the school board, and to the school boards that that preceded you, and the superintendents, uh, Superintendent Ott, and the two superintendents previous, we have a marvelous school system, and one of the backbones of any community is the public school system. I've built distribution centers all over America, and the first thing we looked for when we went 
was not what they had to offer, but what type of public school system they had, because you weren't going to have great employees if there wasn't a great public school system there. So Temple is far and beyond anything else that I see, and there's so much pride. So thank you for letting us be a part of your community. My wife and I thank you for the education our son has, and then what the future of Temple, of the public education, how you have adjusted and really, really soared. So it's an honor to be associated with you. So thank you very much. Item C is the TASB Business Recognition Program, Perry's Office Plus. Macy family, if y'all want to come forward. Today, we are pleased to have the opportunity to recognize okay. other special friends of the district. Uh, Perry's Office Plus has partnered to support Temple ISD in a variety of ways, from fostering strategic partnerships with area businesses and industry, industries, to providing materials for various student projects, to hosting various forums that allow the district to connect with stakeholders to help move the entire community forward. They also have a vested interest in the district as third or fourth fourth generation wildcats semi well depending on where you want to look but i was about the number three at this point okay <laughs> all right there you go so uh, they have a long history with the district and in temple isd we know the value of the help that we receive from perry's office plus and we are deeply appreciative of this partnership and we're pleased to announce that the, your generosity has been recognized at the state level by the texas association of school boards i'd like to uh, present this recognition to you uh, in appreciation for all you've done for the district. Inside, you'll find a letter thanking you for your support and a window decal uh, and a countertop sign that we hope you will display, encouraging others to follow your lead and stand up for Texas public schools. So behalf on Temple ISD, thank you. Thank you Just want to, yeah, Perry and I have known, we've known each other for, well, too many years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> at least five. Yeah, at least five, where I think we were uh, a great apart there. So mm -hmm. Thank y'all for everything y'all have done for the district. I mean, mm -hmm. not only for the business part, but personally, y'all have done it with Education Foundation, uh, just many numerous ways over the years that your family has stepped up in the business, too. So again, thank you. This is definitely well deserved. And thank you all for being an important part of the TISD family. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank you. Yes, I love the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will say, of our three kids, one did graduate from yes. Temple, so that's like 33%, which what? is my average in high school. So yes. that was our number together. So that's yes, pretty good. That's so true. That is true. Certainly, certainly appreciate that. Thank you, it's an honor. Dr. Ott, man, we appreciate it. School board, you guys are awesome. Uh, they're, they're, as we've gone through life, there's been times that we've been extremely proud and times we've been just proud of what this district does. And we are at a time where, man, we're doing incredible things. And it's, it's, it's you guys, but certainly the leadership that you provide, Dr. Ott, is just, is just absolutely awesome. So we appreciate that. And we just appreciate the opportunity to give back a little bit to this community and to this district from what we've received from it. So mm -hmm. thank you, guys. Thank you all for everything. Really appreciate that. Like I said, this is quite an honor. It was unexpected and a great surprise, and so we appreciate that. Thank you. Appreciate your partnership. It's so fun. <laughs> Next item is TASA TASB Award Stars of Distinction to School Architecture Projects. And Stan Tech, we have Barry and, and your crew, if y'all want to come forward. The Texas Association of School Administrators and the Texas Association of School Boards have announced that 48 projects will be included in the 2020-21 Exhibit of School Architecture. 
This online exhibit of new and renovated Texas school facilities includes projects from 34 districts, three colleges, and one regional education service center that were submitted by 18 architectural firms. Eligible projects are newly constructed or renovated public education facilities completed in the past five years and have not previously submitted an application for this exhibit. The exhibit of school architecture awards are given at the discretion of a 12 member jury, which includes four school board members, four school administrators, and four members of the Association for Learning Environments South Southern Region. The juried exhibit awarded stars of distinctions for excellence to 25 projects in one or more of the following six areas, design, value, sustainability, community planning, and school transform transformation. We are pleased to announce that in addition to being selected to the exhibit, Thornton Elementary also received two architectural distinctions for value and, and sustainability. Please join me in congratulating the district and Stantec on this extraordinary honor and thank you to our community for your support of this 2015 bond project. And I, I would just say a big part of teaching and learning is providing a high quality learning environment. Uh, that is so important for our students and an innovative one as well. Uh, and uh, Stantec has worked with TISD for several years over several projects. Uh, we always knew that Thornton was a jewel, but it sure is nice to be recognized at the state level. Congratulations, we appreciate your vision and your patience in working with us on design. I know that's not always easy, uh, but thank you so much for being a partner of TISD and job well done, congratulations. Thank you. So I'll just say real quickly, uh, the one thing that's really important I think are the two actual stars of distinction that we won, value and sustainability. They are a reflection that these schools in Thornton is going to bring value to the community for the life of the building, which will be 50 or more years. And we couldn't be more thrilled that knowing that in that time span, it's going to affect the lives and impact the lives of many of the community's children moving forward. It's our goal, it's our passion to do that. It's also our passion and our pleasure to be a part of the Temple ISD family. I don't, we serve a lot of clients and a lot of school clients, but I can tell you there is none, not one, that is any more special to us than, in, than is Temple ISD. So we are proud to have the opportunity to serve with you guys. Thank you, Barry. Appreciate it. All right, give them another round of applause. Yeah. Our chagrin, that's all the recognition. <laughs> Item five is executive hires, and we do not have any hires. All right. Uh, item six is the board president's report. A, consideration for approval of resolution of the Board of Trustees of Temple Independent School District requesting a waiver of state assessment and A through F accountability requirements for the 2020-2021 school year from the Commissioner of Education. Before y'all should have the resolution, it's in your board packet. I think, you, I think everybody has a hard copy too, but it's definitely in your board packet. I am now going to read the resolution. Uh, whereas on October 7th, 2020, the governor of Texas renewed the declaration of a state of disaster for Bell County and every county in Texas due to the public health risk posed by COVID-19 and Whereas the number of new recorded cases of COVID-19 in Texas public schools, both students and staff, 
has increased for each of the last six weeks, according to data from the Department of State Health Services, and whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has caused a significant reduction in the number of Temple ISD students receiving face-to-face -face instruction for the 2020-2021 school year, and from 8,720 students in the fall of 2019 to 5,928 in the fall of 2020, and whereas the rapid transition from face-to-face -to, -face <clears throat> to hybrid and online instruction has already had negative effects on students' learning outcomes, according to Raise Your Hand Texas. Further, it is likely that Temple ISD students will continue to experience the impact of learning loss in the 2020-2021 school year, and whereas the Temple ISD Board of Trustees is entrusted with oversight of academic achievement and maximizing student performance for the district under Section 11.1515 of the Education Code and Board Policy BBA Legal, and whereas in light of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on student learning outcomes, administering mandatory state assessments in the 2020-2021 school year will not provide the district with effective information about student performance. Further, the potential for lower assessment scores resulting learning loss could adversely affect students both academically and emotionally, and whereas the Commissioner of Education has the authority under Section 7.056G of the Education Code to waive requirements under state law, including requirements for mandatory state assessments. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Temple Independent School District Board of Trustees that, one, all the above recitals are adopted as findings of fact and are incorporated into and made a part of this resolution for all purposes. Two, the superintendent of schools is hereby directed to formally request that the Commissioner of Education waive the requirement that Temple ISD administer the State of Texas Assessment for Academic Readiness STAR exam for grades 3 through 12 during the 2020-2021 school year. Three, the superintendent of schools is hereby directed to formally request that the Commissioner of Education waive the requirement that Temple ISD administer the National Assessment of Education Progress NAEP for students of any grade during the 2020-2021 school year. Four, the superintendent is hereby directed to formally request that the Commissioner of Education waive the requirement of the A through F accountability system during the 2020-2021 school year. Five, the superintendent is hereby granted the authority to determine whether the district should request a waiver from the Commissioner of Education for the requirements to minister any other standardized assessment instrument for the 2020-2021 school year. And six, the superintendent shall inform the Board of Trustees of any decision issued by the Commissioner of Education regarding the district's request for waiver of assessment requirements. And Dr. Ott, I know you want to say a few things about this. Yeah, I'd just make a few comments. Uh, the first thing I would say is that um, uh, really the rationale behind all this uh, has a lot to do with timing because uh, many other school boards and school districts and professional organizations are uh, looking to adopt resolutions uh, to really start a grassroots effort to try to make a, ch to try to make a, a change with respect to the assessment and accountability program. Uh, but the rationale behind that is, is really simple. We are having another non-traditional year. Uh, we had a non-traditional close of last year, and you saw uh, the administration of the STAR test and the accountability system suspended. Uh, and you could make the argument that our students had more traditional instruction leading up to that assessment. Uh, in this case, we're looking at an entire school year, most likely, uh, that are, um, that where we're providing instruction under non-traditional circumstances. Uh, so it would stand to reason that the state would adapt much like local school districts are in terms of teaching and learning, uh, that they would adapt in terms of accountability and assessment. Uh, so that is the rationale behind this. Uh, my charge 
if this is approved, uh, my charge will be to craft a letter and draft that, uh, including all the pieces of the resolution and send it to uh, the commissioner and then report back to the board on the response. Uh, if this is passed, uh, I will tell you there are plenty other districts that I know that are hanging in the ballast uh, waiting to uh, take this resolution forward as well. Do the members have any questions about this resolution? If not, it does require uh, approval. I move that we approve. Okay. Motion by Mrs. Davis. I'll second it. Seconded by Dr. Sanhi. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is approved. Thank you. Item C is future items discussion. Are there any items board wishes to hear at future board meetings? Okay. Item B, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Item B, 2020, 2021 TASA legislative positions and priorities. Uh, I know that the document is in the board book and it was emailed to you. If you get a chance to t uh, take a look at that, it's a, this is gonna be a very important legislative session uh, to make sure, this is what they've already adopted this, uh, so that way we can familiarize ourselves what the TASB's position is on the issues. And we'll be hearing more about different TASB, TASB other organizations going forward to the session. We'll probably get more of updates and report. Okay, thank you. And item uh, C, future, uh, D, future, uh, Important dates in Dr. Ott. Yeah, I just have a few things to uh, bring to everyone's attention. Uh, the first would be this week, November 10th. Uh, I think uh, many of you have invitations to the campus presentations. So I have those highlighted on here as well. I know some of the board members, maybe you haven't had the opportunity uh, to hear the TISD 2025 update presentation, so feel free. I know some of you actually have attended a campus presentation. Feel free to, I know they would welcome you there uh, and you can pick any campus. It doesn't need to be the one in your district. It can be specific single member district, it can be anywhere. Um, but I have those listed, so Ray Allen's November 10th. Uh, we do have our School Health Advisory Council meeting uh, the 11th, the day after, and then I'm presenting to Scott the day after that, the 12th. This Friday, uh, we have a school board retreat, and that one is really uh, a nice follow-up based on our last facilities committee meeting. Uh, and this is really to uh, take a tour, a windshield tour of some of the housing developments that are going on uh, so we can start to piece together this whole thing. Uh, you know, this will come together with the facilities master plan that we'll be taking in December and then a demographic study th that we will hope to take to you uh, February, no later than maybe uh, February board meeting. And with all those pieces together, uh, then we can, you know, make decisions moving forward with respect to uh, bond proposals. Um, we have a school board policy committee meeting the 18th and then the facilities is the 19th right after that. Uh, and then the, oh, let me back up real quick. On November 12th, the Scott uh, Elementary, we do have a time change. That's at four o'clock instead of 345. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. If you're there 15 minutes early, they won't mind. They'd love to talk to you. Um, and then we're off for Thanksgiving uh, that week, November 23rd through the 27th. And then I come back and present to Bonham and we have a special board meeting December 3rd. And that special board meeting will cover two things. It will cover the uh, audit report and it will cover the facilities master plan, uh, kind of in a draft form. So you guys would have a chance to provide input and give us guidance on how to move forward and formalize that plan for the regularly scheduled board meeting. And that is all I have. Of course, on the back, you have um, your list of fine arts um, competitions. I do wanna give a small shout out to our band uh, who competed this last Saturday in Robinson at the marching band competition. And uh, they received all ones superior rating. In fact, uh, with a somewhat depleted band, they actually did better than they did last year. So if you get the chance to, if you see a student that's in band, please brag on them. Uh, our director did a fantastic job too, Brent Matheson, and you will hear them as well if you show up to Wednesday's community pep rally. By the way, whether we have a game or not Friday, the community pep rally is still a go. 
Uh, so we will not be canceling that because we have control over that. Uh, so we're going to do that. And that's at Wildcat Stadium? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ott. Uh, item 7 is consent items. Item 7A through D1. What is the pleasure of the board in hearing these items? I make a motion that we hear them all together. Okay. Motion by Mr. Gaines. Second the motion. Seconded by Mrs. Davis. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Aye has it. The uh, motion passes. The items are approved. I uh, just do want to point out one item, the softball press box. Uh, that was part of our gender equity plan. It's long overdue. So we're so glad to see that is coming to fruition. It is now, um, I think, when should we have? We'll have it before softball for sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, well done. It's definitely needed. Item eight, action items A, human resources. One, consideration for approval of memorandum of understanding, MOU, between Temple Independent School District and Mid Midway Independent School District. Um, before Mr. Palmer starts, you know, in order, in order to do something for him, it has to be a curveball. So, uh, could you please come up here to the front? You, Mr. Palmer. Yes, okay. Um, so, um, a couple of years ago, HR started these awards. They've started many. There's so many of them. Well, I, th I think we celebrate everything and everybody. Uh, but one of them is the MVV award, and it's the most valuable veteran. Um, in, to not disclose my age uh, or how long he's been in, uh, serving public education, I, I'll just tell you he's been doing it longer than I've been alive. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but we do want to present you this pin um, at the board meeting in front of everybody and thank you for your service to Temple ISD and public education altogether. Uh, so we would like to give this to you and congratulate you. You know, he's always handing these out, all the assistant soups to everybody. It's kind of nice to, to, to give him one as well. I do think he was actually surprised. Yeah, Good I, job, I, assistant soups. That's way to, Donna, that's a way to keep it from him. That doesn't usually happen. <laughs> it doesn't. That's right. That probably should be the, the Mo Award, the most oldest educator. <laughs> Something like that. I'll put that. My, my, my other pen broke. So the one that had some other stencils well, I'm on I'm not doing I have to do Oh, it. good. <laughs> Scare me. All right. Uh, you ready, Mr. Posey? Board members, uh, the a memorandum of understanding that I have is uh, to present to you tonight is between Temple ISD and Midway. Uh, independent school district, which is kind of a unique uh, opportunity to work together with uh, uh, our neighbors up the road. Uh, we don't have to play them anymore, so that makes it more fun to work with them. Uh, but in any case, this is a, an opportunity for a number of our teachers, over 30 at this point in time, to uh, work to attain the National Board Certification uh, recognition. And if you've looked at the TIA, the Teacher Incentive Allotment, uh, level one or the first level exempt. Exemplary level? I never, yeah, I think that's level one. Uh, once they complete this, they're entitled to the monies that go with that. Uh, and that starts at about $5,400 a year. And so um, this is an opportunity for uh, any of our teachers, but uh, right now there's a few, uh, just right over 30 uh, that have selected to do this. This is a very complex and, and challenging um, uh, attainment for them to do. Uh, it's been um, uh, equated to that of a, uh, of a master's degree or even more. Uh, there are four different sections to uh, expertise that are lined out. And so in order to do that, you need someone to, to mentor and walk you through it. And so there are two individuals at Midway ISD that have the national certification and also have the ability to train our teachers. Uh, they're already in a position to train there, so what we did was come alongside of, of uh, that district and ask could ours do it as well and basically the agreement is that we would pay them what they were going to pay for their teachers to also do ours 
and, uh, and it's quite an opportunity. Uh, it's, it's a blessing in disguise that there'd be someone this close and that we can rely on people that have been through it, that, have, that are trained and outstanding trainers uh, to start with. So this is, a, I, I do believe, a, a great opportunity for uh, our, any of our teachers. Uh, and, and also it's an opportunity for them uh, to get, on, get in on uh, the TIA money uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, I think there's always concern, is it going to be there? So this, is, this would be level one, which would range from about 5,200 to I think 60, close to 7,000 a year. So that's the proposal before you. Are there any questions? Anybody have any questions? This item does require approval. I'll make the motion to approve it. Motion by Dr. Sanhi. Second. Seconded by Mr. Gaines. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you, Joe. I guess item two is update seven two is update on teams team up program. Is expand the awareness of the needs in order to, to understand people of, of different cultural backgrounds. Uh, this is our team up committee, uh, and you can see we have uh, administrators from different counties. Uh, we're very happy to have the head of the state here with us today. This is our, our team up committee uh, in order to, to discuss uh, how to go about this. And I'll, I'll tell you this, that in fact there was an article today in the, uh, in, in the uh, principal newsletter that comes out each day and then cultural awareness and understanding increase the capacity of everyone. Uh, to me, out of this, I, I, I want to make me a better person. You know, I, I, want, I want to make sure that every person that comes up here is a better person. This is just a timeline, and I think y'all can see it on your computers. It just talked about the different meetings we started out on September 1, and that's actually This is, what, this is what it basically came out to look like. This is the, the, the yellow sheets with the dots. 
And what we're trying to do is determine how, how is Temple doing in these areas. There, there are five um, statements on the left-hand side, and, and it should read, Temple ISD does not do this, they do this, or they excel in doing this. And those were the five statements that we asked them about. I think it's really interesting on that chart. Well, you see, I've got this is John Stanton. Uh, <laughs> instead of the yellow one with dots. This one, the first thing was mindful, mindfully behave in a manner that demonstrates a value for diversity for each other. And, and basically what they're saying, Temple ISD does that, and in some cases, excelling. being inclusive, and you see did a good job on that one. The third one was a little confusing the way it was asked because it kind of had a double negative in it, uh, but it said cease uh, to expect those who are different to suppress your differences. In other words, the point of the reality is that you can be different. I will tell you that if you see the, the, the uh, orange stars are our Hispanic group, they put does not, but that's good. The, the way it was asked, it was kind of in reverse, and when we met with them, it's like, no, no, they do well, the district does well at that. Now, when you look down at the Caucasian, the white stars, they have some deals on this side there's some concerns about. One is actively develop cross-cultural knowledge and skills. Is that really happening? And, and, and they felt like it was not. Uh, I think it's been a little bit of a ways outside of one's own worldview to gain a more accurate understanding. And again, and I think that's coming from a point of view that I really, I'm not, I haven't really been doing that. To be honest, I haven't been doing that. And so that was the point of that. Uh, key findings was that all focus groups expressed wanting to participate in discussion together. Uh, we divided them up. Uh, we had our African American black uh, uh, teachers and so forth in one room, Hispanic in another, and white in another. And one of the things they said was, we want to all get together too. We don't want this to be, you know, but the women get the wrong thing to say what they said back there. Why is that? Well, it's because of the All focus groups felt like the district does a good job of focusing on cultural awareness. All groups uh, appreciated uh, the open dialogue and awareness of cultural difference uh, in staff. And then campus leadership was a key to drive this forward. different cultural, different ethnic groups, it's going to be driven by the campus administration. That's, and, and, and if, if you've listened to things over the years, and numbers have been on board for a good while now, it always goes back to that campus, and it goes back to the campus administration so often as, as what sets the tone. And then the next steps, uh, first of all, district-wide cultural response survey, which there is no, I can't pull that from anywhere, so I'm going to have to rely upon Donna's um, survey making, and she's very talented at that, by the way. Uh, she thinks up more questions than you can imagine. And so uh, we're going to come up with a district-wide <laughs> survey. And this, this is actually the survey that we did for the Hispanic Group. Uh, trying to, to determine how can, how can we create a, an environment uh, that all people feel welcome and
and that, that all different ethnic groups can still have uh, that, that they appreciate and that they can enjoy. Thanks, Joe. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions? Joe, the, the committee was selected, but anyone who wanted to participate in the discussions yes. district wide yeah, could do. As far as the folks that came, we made a, a, a committee kind of selected different ones themselves. In other words, th those on uh, the, the, uh, the main committee or the head committee, they selected various teachers from different campuses for input uh, based on their ethnicity, and they did that at several different places. It's kind of interesting on that. And is it is it fixed now, or is it or will is it that number fixed now, or more, will more people oh, no. be allowed to participate no. that hear about it? I don't think I don't think we ever want to fix the number. To be honest, I, I think as far as the larger groups, uh, it's it's wide open. Uh, and, and to me, that All right, thank you, appreciate it. Item B, Curriculum Instruction 1, 2021-2022, Temple High School Course Catalog Presentation. Ms. Rogers Ms. will Rogers. be presenting. All right, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Posey and members of the board. I appreciate you giving me a few minutes of your time for me to go through a few of the catalog changes that will um, be happening for the Temple High School catalog for the 2021-2022 school year. Um, and so I believe in your packet you have a summary of those changes, and I won't go through all of them, but I do want to touch on just a few, starting with social studies. And so in social studies, we're adding two ethnic studies courses. Uh, these courses are relatively newly approved by the state, and so um, the African American Studies course just recently approved, I think, in April, but Dr. Adams and I have been watching these courses through the approval process for um, well over a year and having discussions about how we want to um, offer those to students in Temple ISD. Um, our intent is to be very purposeful about how we implement these courses so that we're ensuring that we have the appropriate curriculum, that we have a well-defined scope and sequence, and that we have the resources, uh, instructional resources to support instruction and student learning for those courses. And so we're actually partnering with the Region Service Center so that we can develop those curriculum documents. Uh, so we are excited to offer Ethnic Studies, African American Studies, and Ethnic Studies, Mexican American Studies as elective credit to our juniors and senior, seniors for the coming school year. Um, it's a great addition to the course offerings that we're already offering in social studies and also a great opportunity for students to learn about the history and um, cultural contributions of African Americans and Mexican Americans to American history. Um, again, this is an elective credit, and so uh, just like psychology and sociology, students elect to take the course. It's not required. Um, it's added to the list of courses that leads to an endorsement in arts and humanities for our students. And it also complements the work that uh, we've been doing in CNI uh, and having conversations with teachers about culturally responsive teaching. And so again, we're just very excited to offer those courses to our students. Uh, the other changes that I want to make you aware of are our IB courses. 
which traditionally were awarded one credit hour for math, science, social studies, and English. And the state has recognized, as you are well aware, um, the intense effort that is required and the rigor that's required in those courses. And so the state is recognizing that with um, an award of two credit hours for those courses instead of one. So students will, take, will receive two credits instead of one for those courses. Uh, the last thing that I'd like to just explain to you is the removal of the articulated credit information from the course catalog. The state governing body that uh, supervises um, community colleges no longer allows community colleges to work with high schools and school districts to offer articulated credit. Wow. And so because Temple College is not able to offer that to our students, we had to remove it from the course catalog. Uh, but we are continuing to push dual credit and uh, increase our awareness for students of their dual credit opportunities. And so those are all the changes that I'm going to discuss with you. Are there any questions that you have for me? Members, any questions or comments? I think the timing of this class is, is very well, it, for the time that it's hitting and what's going on in the country and around the world yeah. now, I think it's great timing for these classes. I agree. Yeah. It's what, yeah, perfect timing. It's be a benefit to the students at the high school. We're very excited about it. Yes. And I, I'd make a comment if I can. I'm sorry I'm a little late to the party. Um, but the, I, I do want to thank the curriculum department for this has been a very methodical process. You know, the state had to approve the courses first, right? We had to wait on that. Then we have to research curriculum and we have to find the right person to do this and take the time to make sure that, that they're able to get the certifications necessary. And really this is, in my mind, this, is, this comes out of a couple things. One, it's a response to staff that have had these conversations, right, and students. I have students in my superintendent advisory group that have talked about uh, these things. And then the, the other piece of it is, let's just call it what, I mean, we're a multicultural high school. We're a multicultural school district, society. And, uh, you know, part of our charge is to educate students. And this is a great opportunity to allow students to be in a safe environment, right, and to learn about one another. Uh, I was very excited about this. I like uh, the fact that Lisa and, and Reynada have, have made this a upper level class because that would allow for the uh, meaningful and en engaging conversations to take place because as you know, their minds for the most part are more mature uh, than say freshman or sophomore. Oh, it's one of these I have to take, you know, kind of thing. So uh, we're very proud of this. We think it's gonna be a good thing. Uh, and it's going to uh, really help us learn more about one another and be a more inclusive learning environment. So I really appreciate the CNI department and all the work they've done. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all. Appreciate it. C is finance and facilities. Uh, one update on bond refunding. And Mr. Boyd. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Posey, Dr. Ott, and board. Uh, I'd like to... Uh, provide you all an update tonight on the bond refunding, uh, which uh, uh, has taken place in recent months. And... Do it again? Oh. There. There we go. All right, sorry, I was punching the wrong one. Okay, um, so what I would like to uh, talk to you about a little bit is just give you an update on a refunding that we brought to your attention or refunding opportunity we brought to your attention back in March. Uh, now we've gone through the process and we wanted to update you and give you a little news on, on what that process has been like. Uh, now, bear in mind, the, uh, uh, this is refunding of old bonds. So this has nothing to do with the current bonds. This has to do with, in particular in this case, the 2011 series bonds. And, uh, you all recall these projects? These were the, the, the major projects of that bond and really got us moving forward. So exciting stuff that came from that. It seems like a long time ago, but uh, uh, you see the, the primary campuses that were uh, uh, locations and campuses that were impacted by that. Um, so uh, just summary on the bond refunding. Back in, in <clears throat> excuse me, in March, uh, we came to you all. That was actually, I believe, our first virtual meeting following 
all heck breaking loose with, uh, with COVID. And uh, we had Jennifer, uh, who's our uh, uh, specialized public finance, was on the call and spoke to us and talked about that. And at that time, you all authorized us to go out and look for bond refunding opportunities. Uh, that, uh, that approval gave us basically a year to get that done. Um, so uh, at that time we did that, you gave us an authorization to refund those bonds subject to savings being at least 5%. And let me take a step back. Refunding, uh, in a, kind of a fancy term, but in its, uh, in its basic sense, it's the same thing as refinancing. Uh, it's, it's, it's what if you refinance your car to, for a lower rate, refinance a mortgage for a lower rate. Refunding is technically the process by which you do that with bonds because you actually uh, take bonds at a higher rate, turn around, uh, issue bonds at a lower rate to pay off those bonds, and then you pay, you pay a lower rate into, uh, uh, throughout the life of the bonds. So uh, they brought to us a plan and said, look, if, if we ask for your approval, you all approve that. Uh, that if we could get at least 5% savings, it was worth our while to do that as a district. Again, these are from the original 2011 bonds. Uh, and so uh, the 10th year of payoff uh, is uh, February 1st of 2021. Again, it's hard to believe time flies. Uh, but these bonds become callable, uh, or in this case, something that we can go out and refund uh, on January 1st, 2021. Uh, so, in summary, they went through the summer, they watched the markets, uh, obviously COVID was, uh, had a bearing on the markets. Uh, they wanted to find a, a perfect spot that was uh, uh, where things were stable. And so in October, they felt like that was a good opportunity because uh, the COVID concerns in the market had stabilized somewhat. This was also prior to a presidential election, which obviously following that, they weren't sure uh, what would happen in bonds like, I mean, uh, markets like, like certainty uh, and so instability. Uh, they, they wanted to try to hit it at a good time, so they did in October. Uh, specialized finance, public finance served as our financial advisor. Uh, that's Jennifer Ritter that you all know well. McCall per Parkhurst and Horton was our bond counsel. Raymond James was the senior managing underwriter. Sam Coe and Bank of Oklahoma uh, served as co-managers. So the amount of remaining outstanding principal uh, that will be effective on uh, February 1st is $27,235,000. The original interest rates on those bonds were anywhere from 3% to 4 and a quarter percent back when we uh, initiated that following the, the uh, 2011 uh, approval. Bonds are set to retire in 2036, so these are all 25-year bonds. Uh, that's how most of ours are. In March, when, um, uh, when Jennifer spoke to us, uh, the, the projected savings were a little under $4 million, about $3.9 million, and, or 11 and, and, and 0.2% over the course of the bond payoff. Uh, but fortunately, we were able to do significantly better than that, and that's what I want to bring to you tonight. Um, actual refunding savings that we were able to achieve was $6.3 million or 19.7% over the remaining life of the bonds. Uh, that was a significant, significant accomplishment. And, and most of it's due, honestly, to Jennifer and her team knowing when the best time is to strike and for those underwriters uh, and, uh, and positioning as well. The other pieces that play a part in this, our bond rating uh, and the work that we've done as a district uh, on, in our financial standing and to maintain a strong bond rating, that also gives us the ability to do that. It's really no different than if you're going to uh, refinance something. Uh, if you have a good credit score, you're going to get a better rate. And so certainly that had something to do with this was uh, the bond uh, rating that we have and the work that we've done as a district to do that. So the bonds are still set to retire. Oh, let me back up. So those old interest rates were from three to four and a quarter, depending on the year of, uh, of maturity. Uh, these bonds are at an average interest rate of under 2% or 1.932%, so that's a significant savings. Uh, bonds are still set to retire in 2036. We didn't change the life of them. Uh, and those annual debt service payments are reduced from, and they're different from year to year, but the, the, the least savings over the next 15 years we would have would be $261,000. Uh, 
the greatest savings in a particular year would be five hundred sixty-six thousand uh, dollars, and that begins in in twenty twenty-two. So at the end of the day, the refunding leads to an estimated annual savings of approximately half a cent to one point three cents on the tax rate. Uh, so that will will take effect, and again, that depends on the year uh, and the rate that we were get for that particular year. Uh, based on current values and collection percentage, a, a hundred thousand dollars worth of valuation on a home. Uh, would save about $13 a year. Now, in the grand scheme of things, $13 a year may not sound like a lot, uh, but that's significant. Uh, when you extrapolate that over the remaining 15 years and you think about what those values are. Uh, and so I think really uh, what we wanted to bring to you tonight and we, what we want folks to know is that any opportunity we get, uh, we're, we're going to, to talk to our financial team to our financial advisors, to our bond council, and we're going to look to reduce debt and reduce the interest rate we're paying at any opportunity that we can find to do that. Uh, and that's something that is certainly uh, something we want uh, the taxpayers to be pleased with. Again, these are real savings, and these are real savings, and these are just lower amounts in taxes they will have to pay to retire the existing debt that was already approved. And so that's always something we're going to look for. Uh, again, I can't say enough about the advice that we receive from our financial advisors. Uh, they, they do an excellent job of helping us uh, not just save, but, but maximize what we can save. Do you all have any questions about that or about the process? One question, though. If you get ready to refund these and it's 1.93, uh, now, it's going to go harder to get the money to save You, you probably won't. It's probably a one-time shot. Um, you know, Ronnie, it's funny. They've been, we've been talking about historical lows for several years now, and, and at some point uh, those rates are going to go up. Uh, and, uh, and, and so what, what they try to do is find the, really the, the most opportune time to strike and uh, if you continue to wait, there is the possibility of doing a little better, uh, but there's also then you're going to keep paying those taxes if you if for every year you put it off, you're going to pay that higher amount. So it's it's just that fine line of trying to find out, and then then if rates rise, you've you've lost your opportunity or your leverage. So um, I I think for now rates still appear to be pretty stable. No one ever knows what's going to happen, but but I think. I think their feeling was it would be very, very difficult to do better than that at any point in time now or in the future. So that's, that's when they, they uh, said this is, our, this is our, what we believe to be the best opportunity for savings. Kent, I just want to thank you, uh, your department, and bond council for your hard work in saving the taxpayers uh, quite a bit of money. This is important for the district, important for the community. Thank you. That we do this. It is, and, it, and it's, as we always talk about all these things, it, these are team efforts, yeah. teams, the, the groups within the district in this case, and those that we work with outside right. of the district. I think the it district. helps us, too, so, when we go out for new bonds, when you're doing, you, you handle it Monday that well on this one, you know, new bonds, it helps us when you get rid of a new ones. Yes, sir. It, well, it, it lowers the rate so that if, if a bond were approved in the right. future and you had to raise the rate, you yeah. wouldn't have to raise it as much, right. or, or you've lowered the starting point of that. So that's exactly correct. Yeah. It gives you more capacity. Uh, it's mindful of the taxpayers, and it, 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 it just lowers the cost that you're paying for that borrowing, and then ultimately what the taxpayers are paying, it, it lowers that, and, and those are some significant real numbers. I'll tell you what, uh, I mean, $6.3 million, even though that's spread over 15 yeah. years, that's still a lot of money. Uh, and that's a significant real savings. And so uh, uh, we were just really excited about the way this came out and, and very pleased with it and very grateful for it. So uh, uh, we're thrilled to be able to show it to you all and, and present it to the community. Thanks. Yes, sir. Item two is the Meredith Dunbar ECA renderings. All right. Okay. Thank you. There it is. All right. Thank you, Mr. Posey and Dr. Ott. Didn't it didn't do my little uh, my little my little purple background? Well, is it? It is. Okay. I'm gonna. 
Yeah, it looks a little more purple here. I tried to, you know, I tried to. School colors, so. I know. It just looks bleached on this one. That, that, that looks a little more purple. So I, that, that was a little more fancy, so. All right, but a little purple. I didn't want a lot of purple, so it's just trying to find that sweet spot. Um, I wanted to bring you all this update too tonight. And those of you on the facilities committee have heard pieces about Meredith Dunbar for some time now. This project is, uh, it's two or three things. One, it's very complicated. Um, we've run into some complications because of the nature of the project. It is a thorough renovation of an older facility and that always brings challenges. Uh, but the other thing that this project is, is an incredible opportunity to revitalize a campus and to showcase the history of that campus and that part of our community. And so what I wanna walk you through tonight are a few things. The first few pictures are the construction pictures where we are. They're not the really pretty ones. Then we'll get to some of the renderings that are the exciting pieces and, um, and I think you'll be really excited. We're, we're very excited. I'll also say this too, and I know Stantec's already gone, but you know, they've been very instrumental in this, and Rory in particular has worked closely with Dr. Ott, I know, and, uh, and it, with information on timelines and so forth that I think are really going to draw out the history and put it in full display at Meredith Dunbar. So they've been a real partner, and uh, they're a partner to us in multiple ways. But uh, just to recap, uh, total project budget is $9 million. Uh, you all approved the GMP back in January. Abatement and demolition began in March, asbestos abatement and demolition began in March, uh, and the project is scheduled for completion in July of 2021, so, uh, uh, so next summer. Uh, all the kids have been moved into portables for the year, and uh, that's worked very well. Uh, they've been uh, all in one location, which is nice for them, and so uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been very good from a security and safety standpoint to keep them separated, obviously, from the construction. So I want to show you a few before and after picture, pictures. This is the kitchen before demolition. You're familiar with it. And if, as you all remember, this was uh, one that was the last one that still had not had air conditioning. Uh, it was uh, very small, very cramped, uh, and was in great need of improvement. Uh, this was, that was the serving line you saw. This was the kitchen area and the cooking area. Uh, so, uh, and our food services department has done a great job of updating equipment when they could through the years. Uh, in doing things and trying to make things uh, operational in, in a very functional way, but, but it was high time that we make some serious improvements there. Uh, that is, uh, once we gutted it uh, and we took uh, everything out and we were just down to the bare bones in that, uh, in that cafeteria area, and that's what happened once we really gutted it. So um, one of the challenges that we've run into there uh, knowing that there would have to be underground plumbing and repairs that would take place, uh, we initially uh, realized that that would have to happen, but expected to be able to cut into places into the existing slab uh, to be able to make those repairs. When American constructors began cutting into this slab, it began to give way in places. So really, this picture and the next one demonstrate what actually happened when, when they begin to, and I'll put in a plug for American too, this is a challenging project and they've been great at communicating with us and giving us options and leading us through challenges that we've run into. And this was a huge one. Uh, all of that area we fully expected to be uh, stable and it was not. So we've had to take out the entire floor in that area down to the existing uh, beams. And so uh, they will now work at all the plumbing will be done and we'll go back to pouring in uh, a slab there. That, that's one of the, the things that we didn't anticipate. We knew we'd have some challenges there. We didn't know it'd be at that magnitude. But again, it's going to be great when it's done. I uh, want to show you the back wing. Some of you in the facilities committee saw this a couple of months ago. This was back in the summer. And when we say we gutted it, we gutted it. And they took out uh, all of the old windows, all of the old uh, uh, wall pack air conditioning units and literally had to take the whole thing out. Originally, they planned to take out the windows and leave the concrete filling or the, the cinder block filling that was in the middle. When they began to take out the windows, some of that began to fall out with it just because those windows, those old steel window frames were actually holding in place. 
So that's what it looked like back in the summer. That's what, that's what we looked like last week. So you can, you can tell that they're making progress, sealing that up, uh, putting in new walls, uh, preparing for uh, all of the uh, new windows and the new air conditioning units. That's an up, uh, up close look. So we were able to, the integrity of the structure of the building uh, is still fine, uh, but we had to basically rebuild that whole, uh, that whole exterior um, wall to support the windows and the new air conditioners. These are new windows that have already gone in at the, at the gym. So I think these are all things that you can say, wow, when you remember what the old ones looked like, the old steel full of asbestos, the, the single pane glass, uh, these are a huge improvement, not only in appearance, but will be in energy efficiency. So uh, they're circling those, and they just about got all of those in at the, uh, at the gym. So that, that'll make a huge difference in, in appearance, again, in performance both. Uh, restrooms, we kind of ran into some of the same things we did in the, uh, in the kitchen. Uh, because so much plumbing had to replace, they had to take out huge chunks of the slab. Uh, so that gives you a look of what that looks like after uh, the slab has been taken out before they poured the new one. And that's a picture of what the one next door looked like, next door to that one picture I showed you, where they'd already re-poured the slab. So uh, again, they're at, that pro they're at that point where the, it's not easy to see progress yet, but once they get some of these things taken care of, you'll start to see the things that make it look pretty and make it look nice and make it look functional and that you, know, you can start to see the end in sight. Uh, this was one I also showed last summer, uh, back in the summer, to the facility committee. That is one of the two uh, areas where they had to take out steps, and so all of that concrete on that front wing had to come out, uh, and we, we need to make ramps so it's ADA compatible. You can see everything that was underneath there. Uh, we haven't done much now, but you can, that can tell you, you can see what they're doing. They're using carton forms to fill in that void. And when it's time, they'll come in and then they will pour the concrete over that carton form. It forms in place over time, the carton uh, goes away, but, uh, but the ramps are, uh, are there to stay. So that's just kind of an interesting look at, at what, what that process looks like. Uh, there is one of the classrooms, uh, and that gives you a, a, a chance to see what's going on above the ceiling. Um, as you recall, one of the things that we're needing to do here is a fire suppression system throughout the building, and so that requires taking out all of that existing ceiling, much of which was right up next to the decking. This in particular is on the first hall. Uh, each of the wings was built a little bit differently, so some weren't as challenging. This, this first wing is extremely challenging, uh, but that gives you a, a picture of uh, kind of what, what the roof or what the ceiling looks like inside those rooms where they've gutted those. Now to the prettier pictures. So this is the rendering of the front entryway when visitors will walk into the campus. Uh, and this is going to be a, a magnificent point of reference and point of pride for that campus. So you walk in, you see there's your first hallway, uh, there's the library behind those two folks, and then there's the hallway that leads down to the cafeteria you see there. And you can see the Joe Green piece there in a minute. I'll show you some close up of that uh, here shortly. Um, yeah, these are, that's just really white. Um, yeah, you, you get a, a much better image there of, of what that front's going to look like. Uh, another important point, that um, the entry vestibule, we did not have a secure vestibule in the past. We will have one when this is completed. So, and that's something that you know is, is a really important point of emphasis for, for us on every campus. So there will be a secured vestibule and a place to check in uh, when, uh, uh, when this is completed. And you're starting to see some of the other images on the walls that I'll show you here in a bit. Uh, this is just an example of what the first hall would look like. Actually, that's the middle hallway. Uh, but, but they'll all have, obviously, purple will be incorporated into it. Uh, we tried to simplify the colors. Uh, originally, there were a lot of colors involved, and we felt like it was going to be too busy. So Dr. Ott, uh, Ken Wolf, and I have had a couple of meetings through the last few months with Stantec to refine some of those and, and really uh, try to make it simpler where it still honors the purple, uh, but it's not overbearing, and it's still very child-centered also. Now, this one is really exciting, and, I, and I'm going to break this into pieces so you can see it. This is the wall that will be on the outside of the auditorium that you will look at before you enter the auditorium. Uh, you see the two uh, light there. 
Those are the doors. Yes, I can't, can't get that to go. Yes, you see the two big gray areas. Those are the doors, entry doors. So the timeline will go inside of the building, and uh, it's going to be, a, I think, just a, an incredibly special piece. This will be built out of laminate, like some of the things we've done on the other campuses to give it something really special. Like so, the high school library. Yes, sir. Like that, like the Mustangs at, uh, at, at Travis, like the, 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 the pictures at, uh, at our award-winning Thornton and, and uh, you know, all of that. It's, it, it, it's there for a long time. Uh, so I'm going to break it in pieces for you. And again, this is not final. Uh, this was a rough draft that Rory's working on that he sent to Dr. Ott and I a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we need to make sure all of our information and timeline is, is correct on these things and names. But let me also say this. Rory's put his heart into this, too, and he's done research, and he's continued to work on that. But we'll start with the, the beginning, with uh, names and faces in, in 1951. Uh, the next section uh, has uh, the years 64 through 88. Uh, you see some pictures there. Uh, the first picture uh, has Mr. Dunbar. This picture has Mr. Meredith. Uh, you see graduating classes. You see uh, old clips from the newspaper, and this was information that Dr. Ott uh, was able to get from uh, some of our uh, yeah, let me get resident yeah, historians. Now, credit, uh, oh. for sure. Steve dug through all kinds of stuff. And, and then, uh, what was the other person? Mm -hmm. Ms. Yeah, Curtis. Yeah. Ms. Curtis as well, who really was a historian behind having all this stuff. And then the easy part is just asking Joe Green. I think it's going to be incredibly special. I, I mean, I think it, it's going to be one of those things that you just uh, is a is a wow moment and a, and a source of pride. And I think it, it, I think it's just an incredible idea. And it's it's just it's a long process getting it right because once you put that in laminate, it's there to stay. So that's the process that I know Rory's been going through and bouncing things off of us. And ultimately, before we send that to print, we're going to make sure. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely sure everybody's name is right and a date, dates and so forth. So, uh, uh, and then the final section brings us to the current uh, stage and has, has uh, images of, of kiddos that, are, that have been using that in the last few years. And I think that's pretty cool because that's, that's the life of this building. And it has evolved from uh, really every level, every level has been educated there. It's, it's served, as, served middle school students, high school students, elementary students, early childhood students. There's not another building in this community, and there's very few that can say that they have educated children of all ages at one point in time. That's, that's huge. Um, and then, then Dr. Ott mentioned uh, Joe Green. Obviously, he plays an important role in this. Oh, I went too far. No, go back. Um, there will be two locations where we will uh, 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 pay emphasis to him. Uh, he's been, and Dr. Ott again has worked closely with him on these, and uh, uh, Rory's worked through the pictures and, and designed uh, how these things will look. So uh, I think that's that's in a seating area out front in the uh, the main the main area out there outside of the auditorium. And then to me, the maybe my favorite piece of this is Stan Tech took the information and delivered uh, a product that that not only um, shows. Joe Green and his accomplishments uh, and, and the personal items and his attributes, but it makes it child-centered. I mean, this is, at the end of the day, a school for small children. And so they made Joe Green, the way they, they produced that, uh, instead of looking mean, he's giving you a high five. And so uh, that's, I think, just so, when I saw this, I thought that was the coolest thing. So again, this is to be historical, it's to be interactive, it's to be uh, certainly something for pride for, for the community around Meredith Dunbar, but also the Temple community. Uh, and it's, it's going to be, at its heart still, a wonderful learning environment for our youngest students. So, exciting stuff. I probably talked too long. I'm sorry if I did. Uh, this is a cool project. And I know I say that about a lot of our projects, but this one is too. Very cool. And, so and any, any questions, John? Uh, can I make a real quick comment on this? Because uh, this is really exciting, this piece. Joe had 
real concerns about his picture being in Meredith Dunbar because, in his words, he didn't want to scare the little kids. <laughs> and, uh, and so he was really concerned about that. And when Rory put this rendering together and uh, was sent over in an email to him and Charlotte, uh, I got a phone call within 10 minutes, and I'm going to tell you, he is so happy um, that uh, the architects and everyone, that they've come up with a way um, to where he is portrayed in a way uh, that's, you know, kid-centered, and he doesn't feel like he's intimidating anyone, and he can be part of them and their education. And I can tell you the principal there has already come up with traditions in her mind, like, you know, after they graduate, they can all give them a high five or what have you. But uh, this is really special. It, it truly is. And, and uh, like Ken, I, sh I share Kent's sentiment on this. I am so uh, happy and excited, and I just think this is going to be a timeless piece for the community. I really do. Thank you. This is an exciting presentation to see what's going on now and to see what it's going to be. Yeah, it's, Thank you. Thanks. D is student services. I don't, we have anything. E is board committee reports. One, facilities committee update. Meeting held October 29th, 2020, 4 p.m. Uh, Mr. Gaines. Uh, the facility meeting, meeting was called to order at 4.02 p.m. A presentation of the corporate campus project was uh, presented by Mr. John Keeler provided us a presentation to the corporate campus project. The project is a master uh, plan mix use development in the northwest quadrant of Temple. The upscale project would uh, include office spaces, general retail opportunities, and potential for accommodate up to 5,000 residents throughout the, a combination of homesteads or large acreage plots, traditional single family housing, uh, townhouses and multiple family housing. The goal of the project is to attract businesses and professionals to Temple by offering a, a strategically arranged residential employment and recreational op options in one location. Uh, the vast majority of the project footprint is located within Temple ISD boundaries and could serve as a uh, significant development for the district. In addition, provisions for future school campuses would be included in the master plan. Development in the area could begin within the next five to eight years. The meeting was adjourned at 525 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Posey. All right, Mr. Gaines, thank you. Item two is a policy committee update. Meeting held October 28th, 2020, 4 p.m. Uh, Mrs. Davis. The meeting was called to order at 4.02 p.m. The committee reviewed the attestation statement for ADA hold harmless beyond the first two six-week reporting periods. With lower enrollment this year, the district will more than likely benefit from this extension. Dr. Ott has signed the form and it was submitted. The committee reviewed a draft resolution requesting a waiver of the state assessment requirements for the 2020-2021 school year. This resolution was discussed earlier at this board meeting. Mr. Hogelberg gave a brief review and highlighted areas of several policies. These policies will be reviewed at this board meeting. The meeting was adjourned at 4.55 p.m. The next policy committee meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, November 18th at 4 p.m. Thank you, Mrs. Davis. Item B is the policy review. Mr. Hagenberg, what excitement do you have for us tonight? Yes, good evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you uh, remember from the last review, we had finished up section D or section B, which was governance. And so we're moving uh, to the other sections, and it was your pleasure to do uh, bits and pieces of the employment, the student section, and the community section all at once. So we took a few of the initial pieces from all those. Uh, so we're starting with DAA legal, and this is uh, 
since it's D, this is the employment section. And when we're talking employment uh, and non-discrimination in general, uh, the protected characteristics for employment are race, sex, religion, age, disability, and genetic information. So that's what, uh, when we're uh, looking at uh, employment, that's uh, what we uh, look at. Uh, for uh, one of our charges with our employment practices and discrimination, uh, it's uh, against the law to be, uh, it's called disparage treatment. That means uh, your practice is overtly uh, discriminatory or in practice, if, even if the, the policy wasn't discriminatory but its result ended up being that way, that's not allowed also. One of, uh, another one of our charges uh, dealing with um, working environment, uh, it is written in law that we have an affirmative duty to maintain a working environment free of harassment. So that means we just uh, can't go on as norm as uh, regular, that we have a, a affirmative duty. We have to specifically uh, work on our, our, our environment and make sure that it is free of harassment. Talking about some of those particular protected characteristics uh, under uh, the sex discrimination category, they include pregnancy in that. Um, one of the things that is required by the district for um, accommodations is that we uh, are required to make reasonable accommodations as long as it's, uh, and the term is de minimis, means we, we uh, if it's uh, too expensive or if it changes our function uh, as a, an organization, then uh, we're not required to do it, do it. But if various accommodations are allowed that are uh, reasonable, then we are required to uh, accommodate those. One of the things that they specifically say that helps us as a district as far as uh, a disability, it does not include drug testing or alcohol testing. So we're still protected uh, for uh, being able to uh, test our employees and test our uh, transportation people. One of the, uh, in the next policy, DAB, uh, it specifically talks about genetic testing. Uh, I know that was a major piece of technology a decade or so ago, and so these policies were put in place. Uh, basically, it's, it's evolved to include medical, family medical history. So that's included in uh, genetic information. Genetic information is confidential. It has to be maintained separate from the reg regular personnel files, and we can only disclose it either to the employee directly or to the court or during uh, possibly determinations from for FMLA. So those are the, the, the except, exceptions that we're allowed to talk about uh, family history and genetic information. And that uh, finishes up the education or the um, employment part, now the discrimination pieces with the student part, looking at FB, uh, it uh, talks about sex, race, disability, and age. And in the uh, protected characteristics of sex, that's where we get into uh, sexual harassment and Title IX requirements. Uh, this also talks about, uh, and, and when you read this, you'll notice a lot of words uh, that when we're talking about special education, uh, talks about a student with a disability, and it's defined as a, having a physical or mental impairment that limits one or more major life activities. And it defines life activities as things like seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, those type things. Uh, and again, we're required to make reasonable accommodations to uh, work with that. Also in this uh, policy is where you end up hearing uh, words like FAPE, the free appropriate public education, the IEP, the Individualized Educational Plan, and also talking about the educational setting and least restrictive environment. So when you uh, hear conversations with special education, that's where those terms come from. 
The, um, another piece for special education, and you might have uh, hear us talk about child find, uh, and that's where uh, we have to uh, look for students who have needs or are believed to have special needs. And so that's uh, where we're required to uh, actively go out and try to uh, find students in, in our community that need that special assistance. There are some exceptions for discriminating on the basis of sex, uh, and these are listed in the policy. One is uh, separate facilities for restrooms and locker rooms. That's uh, specifically mentioned here, and that's allowed. Uh, human sexuality classes, if we, if, uh, we like, you can have uh, uh, boys and girls in separate classes when you uh, talk about sexuality. Music classes, so the choirs, you can have a boys choir and girls choir and not, and you're not uh, going against the discrimination laws. Physical education classes and contact sports, so you can have uh, PE classes and the various uh, sports uh, that can have a girls team and a boys team that's separate. Then the last piece of that policy, FB, you'll uh, notice uh, under equal athletic opportunities. It mentions 10 specific things. You'll recognize that as far as that was the basis of our gender equity plan and those pieces, those categories that we went, that, that came from here. So you'll recognize that when you, you read it. FB local and exhibit, uh, that specifies the Title IX coordinator and the Section 504 coordinator and it's listed in there, which is required. And then the uh, last piece for the student section uh, talks about service animals. Uh, service animals are, it's defined as a dog that's trained to work and perform a specific task to benefit a person with a disability. Um, and uh, th there are various requirements and uh, restrictions for, for that. Uh, one of the uh, things about service animals is that they have to be under the control of the handler. Uh, uh, we had a situation a couple years ago that there was, uh, the dog was, was trained, but it was a very large dog and it was for a kindergartner. And so then that's because a large dog isn't, to be, isn't able to be handled by the kindergartner, so we made other arrangements as uh, far as that is concerned. Um, and Mr. Posey, FBA legal, also specifically mentions miniature horses can be a uh, reasonable accommodation and a service animal, uh, specifically lists that in there. Uh, it does not mention emotional support animals. I know that was a, a, a very popular uh, five, six years ago. Uh, especially on airplanes, and these are service animals through the special ed department, and as far as our district is concerned, emotional support animals uh, are not allowed because it has to be service animal with a specific use to address a specific disability. Then the last piece for uh, non-discrimination, this is the community piece, and this deals with access of programs, and that main, mainly deals with uh, when you read this, this is where we get into, well, we provide interpreters for public meetings and various uh, uh, meetings required at school. And um, the last uh, page there talks about uh, social security numbers and that they're not allowed to be disclosed except for the Internal Revenue Service or if you're talking about records before January 1st, 1975, because a lot of those records that was the, what was listed on it to distinguish who that person was, and now uh, TEA has different codes, different string of numbers that's not associated with social security numbers. Any questions? Anybody, any questions? Eric, I just wanna again thank you for giving us the board uh, this update. It's, it's important for us to, to have this, to know this, but also educate uh, the staff and the community too. This is uh, a very valuable service. So again, thank you for all you do for the district. You're welcome. And uh, actually I got an email today from update 116. It's supposed to come out in January. So we'll uh, 
I don't know if I can wait. We'll be preparing that. And yeah, that's we'll exciting. Get ready to <laughs> present that to you all. Uh, hopefully, uh, got something to look early forward to. Early next school year. Yes. <laughs> call a special meeting. That's we, we may do that. Yes. <laughs> Maybe between Christmas and New Year's. Yeah. We'll jump. <laughs> well, that being no other business, this meeting is concluded. Thank you very much for uh, attending tonight.